Hello, everybody. Welcome to Community Conversations. Thank you for coming this week. Uh, very pleased to have Heidi Bauer here. But before I introduce her, I do want to uh, mention that we are here each week uh, for every Thursday during the winter quarter here. So please come again next week if you would like to. We have schedules in the back which tell our uh, which topics we have for which dates. You can also go to our website, which is lowercolumbia.edu slash conversations. And uh, that also has Zoom links and links to our recordings. So if you miss uh, one particular talk and you would like to hear more about that, you can always go back and watch that. We also have the uh, Lower Columbia College YouTube channel, which has all sorts of videos that the college puts out, including community conversations. So you can check the YouTube channel if you are looking for some event that you missed. Um, but now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. So Heidi Bauer has been teaching English here at LCC for 15 years. Hey, me too, except with history. <laughs> Some of her favorite books include Cheryl Strayed's Wild and Henry David Thoreau's Walden. Books like these have inspired her to take her own long walks and these long walks have inspired her to simplify her own life. In 2022, she has hiked a cumulative 527 miles mostly in Oregon, but also all throughout the Northwest. So please welcome Heidi Bauer. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. So initially when Courtney put out the call for this particular theme, this series, it was guilty pleasures. And so when I was initially thinking about guilty pleasures, normally we frame that in terms of what an English teacher would think of as a guilty pleasure. So essentially anything that's not literature. But I wanted to take this one a slightly different direction. Um, wild is actually something that if you're backpacking, people, they're not so fond of it. And so it was my guilty pleasure when I was backpacking on the Pacific Crest Trail. And the Pacific Crest Trail is the trail, it starts in Campo, which is at the California-Mexico border. And it goes all the way up 2,650 miles through into Canada. I only have done the Oregon portion. So there are um, about 2,150 miles left for me to do. But on this trail, wild is not everybody's cup of tea. So it was my guilty pleasure uh, there. Wild is uh, written by Cheryl Strayed. And the gist of it is her mother died when she was very young, 22, 23. And her mother's unexpected death sent her in a spiral of um, drinking and drugs and extramarital sex. Um, she ended up getting pregnant out of wedlock, having an abortion. And it was just a really, really hard time in her life. So she walked 500 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail. And I love the way that she framed it. She wanted to walk herself back to the person that her mother raised her to be. So a lot of people, hikers don't like this book because Cheryl Strayed set out on the trail with very little preparation. And that encouragement of underprepared hikers putting themselves in dangerous situations without a lot of forethought is something that a lot of hikers don't have a lot of patience for. Among other things, she bought a compass, bought the book that taught her to use the compass, didn't read the book, but brought the book with her. So things like that. She also, um, and this book has been made into a movie, you might be familiar with it, but the movie trailer gives you a sense of the size of her pack. So her pack in the book was nicknamed Monster. So that's another place where people tend to, when they're not underprepared, they tend to overprepare and they have these incredibly heavy packs. So she couldn't read a compass. She brought the compass book. She had this huge pack and uh, people just don't like the, the nature of the inspiration that she was sending out to ordinary humans or actually non-hikers are called muggles, I've just learned. So when they're not taking issue with these things, they're taking issue with just the fact that so much of the book is not about hiking. You know, even in my summary of the book, there's a lot of personal life story, a lot of memoir that surrounds this book. And people who are backpacking just want, I mean, I, I want it too. They just want hiker porn, right? They just want, give me trail, give me more trail. Tell me more about how miserable you were on the trail. And she spins off of that topic quite a bit. So when I'm out there, I hid my love uh, for the book 
But in the meantime, I, I wanted every single one of the experiences she has. God love me, I even bought the shoes, right? So those are the shoes I wore on my first couple of backpacking runs. She had food cravings. She had this huge craving for Snapple. I, I wanted food cravings. Um, I actually developed this really strange craving for canned peach peaches, roasted beets, and whipped cream, none of which I really like outside of this context, but that was, that was my Snapple. Um, she constantly talks in this book about being hungry. I wanted to be hungry. <laughs> and in fact, I heard two hikers once, and one was bragging to the other that he ate two pizzas back to back. And I'm like, challenge accepted. I'm going to eat two pizzas. Nailed it. I ate two pizzas back to back. There are these things that are called hiker boxes. Um, they, there are various places where the trail comes very close to a resort or a campground or a town. So for example, in Oregon, it goes up and over Crater Lake. So if you've ever been to Crater Lake, Mazama Village, um, it goes right past stores like that. And then in a lot of these stores, there'll be a box that's there for hikers and it's kind of take a little, leave a little. So you leave the stuff that you don't want. Usually that's all the food that you can't stand looking at, let alone eating. And then you take whatever you want. So I wanted to rummage through a hiker box. Uh, Cheryl Strayed saw a hiker box and she found a hiking pole, which she desperately needed. It was actually a ski pole. I found dental floss. <laughs> like uh, instead of like, a lot of hikers, you might've heard stories like this. They'll saw the, the handle off their toothbrushes to save weight. I went one step further. I didn't bring a toothbrush. I brought a baggie full of baking soda that I, and then dental floss, but I broke my dental floss and it was just this one piece. So I go to this resort, I open up the hiker box and I'm like dental floss and I rip off the piece I need to stick it in my Ziploc baggie and I was on my way just like Cheryl Strayed. <laughs> She lost toenails. I wanted to lose toenails. She's got it on me. She lost six toenails, but I lost one. And when I did, I texted my son and I'm like, guess what? Guess what I lost? And he was so proud, right? My son has never been prouder. I wanted to smell. I wanted to be given a trail name, all the things. I wanted to sign a trail register. And not only did I want to sign a trail register, I wanted to be stocked on the trail register. So you, um, I love the way that the information travels on the trail. It travels at a very human speed. It travels at walking pace. And so when you come up on one of these, you, you put your name down and then you just kind of check out who's in front of you. And if people are passing you and everybody passes me, then you can kind of see how far ahead they are of you uh, based on when they sign the trail register. And then vice versa, sometimes people are coming up behind you. That happened for Cheryl Strayed. She knew people were behind her. They, um, they knew her name because of who she was in the trail register. I wanted somebody to recognize my name from the trail register. It actually happened. There was this uh, woman, her trail name, I don't know her real name. Her trail name was Twizzler for all the reasons that you would think. She was obsessed with Twizzlers. And she was from Switzerland. And I had just finished fording a river and she came up behind me and she's like, Double Dare, I've been following you for, I don't know how long, but I was like, yes. Cheryl Strayed's been followed, I've been followed. And like Cheryl Strayed, I wanted to make the very dubious um, decision to bring actual books with me. So when like everybody at some point realizes that their pack is too heavy, people offer to lighten it, she clung to her books, I clung to my books. Now she brought literature, I just brought scary books. So one year it was The Exorcist, one year it was Gone Girl, one year it was The Stand, and unlike Cheryl Strayed, like, I could not bring myself to burn a book because that's how you save weight. You read a page, you burn it. You read a page, you burn it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't burn a book. But it did chop my book in half. And when um, I met my husband, he took me out to lunch when I was around sisters. And I was like, can you just take this half of the book home with you? And, and I will reunite the, the, the two pieces later. So that top half was the half that I sent home with him. Never burned the book. So all of those parallels I hungered for, 
but the richest one, and this one I, I was not expecting. This is a relatively isolated endeavor, especially last year, this last summer. So this last summer I hiked all of Oregon. And you probably, if you were around or awake, know that Oregon was pretty much on fire last summer and the summer before and the summer before. But last summer in particular, it was uh, it led to a really isolated trip on my part because one of the fires was at the California Oregon border, the McKinley fire. And a lot of people who are through hikers, so people who go all the way from Mexico to Canada, they scattered there. A lot of them skipped Oregon, jumped up to Washington, hiked to Canada, and then popped back down and did Oregon at the end. Or they popped over to the Oregon Coast Trail and walked up along the coast. So it was a really relatively isolated walk for what you, um, what you typically experience on the, on the Pacific Crest Trail. But even in my isolation, so much trail magic. And I could define trail magic, but I think it's easier to just give you um, an example. So Wild starts, uh, it's a kind of famous scene where she's, she's sitting on the side of a hill. Um, she's taken off her boots because her feet hurt. Her huge pack falls over, catches a boot, flings it off the side of a cliff. That boot is no more. And she picks up the other boot, throws it after it, and then walks, I don't know how many more miles in duct tapes and flip-flops because that's all she has to, to walk until she can get to a place where she can buy new boots. So there's this piece of trail wisdom that I really like and it's don't pack your fears. So you don't pack something just because you're afraid you're going to need it. Your fears, carry actual physical weight on this trail because everything you pack, you have to physically carry. So you don't pack extras just in case. You have the one thing and the one thing is all you have. Um, so that's me on the left there. And you can kind of see on the side of my pack, there's this, there's this water bottle sticking out with a little thing on top of it. So that thing, and it's about this, this tall, about that big around, and it weighs three ounces, and that's my water filter. So you screw that onto a water bottle, and then you just squeeze and drink, and it filters out all the fun giardia and cryptosporidium and all the other things that make you very, very sick. Inside of that three ounce water filter is a little O-ring, right? So just a little piece of plasticky, rubbery white, it's like that big, weighs less than three ounces. I didn't bring an extra one because you don't pack your fears, right? You just take care of your stuff. I think you see where this story is going. So I'm sitting down. Um, I had just come to the first mountain of the Cascades, uh, Brown Mountain. It's south. It's close to California. And all this basalt rock is surrounding me, right? And basalt is a really hard rock. And fun fact, that's one of the most expensive and time-consuming portions of the Pacific Crest Trail that got finished because it's so hard to work with that rock. So I'm sitting there on the rocks thinking, gosh, I hope I don't lose anything because those crevices are really deep. I took my water filter off of my water bottle to refill the water bottle and the, the little o-ring went ping and down in the crevice and away it went and this is going to be a problem because now every time i tip my water bottle over the dirty water with all the fun giardia and cryptosporidium and all those other fun bacteria is going to spout out and what comes out isn't going to be clean anymore so this is a problem so i'm sitting there thinking about this and thinking about how I can fix this with duct tape because duct tape fixes everything. And along comes that guy in the middle and his trail name is Cha-Cha and I'm sure he has a real name. I just don't know what it is. And I'm like, can you help me here? Can you help me figure out how to MacGyver something so that I don't make myself sick when I drink my water? And he's like, oh, I've got an extra O-ring. Here you go. And he just gives it to me. And that's trail magic, right? Just random acts of kindness magic that happened on the trail. There's a very corny saying the trail provides, but that's kind of what happened in that instant. He um, gave me an O-ring and I didn't die from Giardia. So win-win all the way around. So that's a, sm I mean, that's a literally a small piece of trail magic, but it's also really big, right? It's a survival thing. Another kind of trail magic. I mean, this is just a bigger one. So I was walking um, past, it, close to the sisters area, so central Oregon, 
uh, there's a risk. Uh, there's Elk Lake Resort, which is what you see right there. That's uh, Mount Bachelor, which is kind of in the background. And it's about a mile off the trail. And a mile is no big deal unless it's hot and steep and unnecessary, in which case a mile is a very big deal. There's no such thing as only a mile. And this resort was off the trail, but it had showers and water that I didn't have to filter, a charger for my phone, which is really important because your phone is also your navigational equipment, right? It get, tells you where the water is, where the campsites are, where the trail is. These things are really important and you have to charge it periodically. So I thought I'd take the risk and go down, pay for a campsite. It was the only thing I ever had to pay for and you know, get a shower and a good night's sleep. So I, um, I go down, I, I pay for my campsite and I'm blundering around trying to find it. If you've ever been to a developed campground, they don't make any sense, right? Like, and I'm, I'm traveling at foot speed. So I'm trying to, you know, okay, so turning the map and okay, that's to the right. And I'm trying to find my poor little campsite. It's HB, it should be easy to remember. My name's Heidi Bauer, so HB. And I couldn't find it anywhere. So I'm not used to walking on roads at this point. So I just go blundering cross country right through somebody else's campsite. Uh, they were there for a wedding and they made a point of telling me that it was an Irish wedding, also known as the entire groom side of the family had flown in here from Ireland and they were about to kick up their heels and have a real party. So I'm blundering through their campsite, just looking for my own. And they're like, do you want some champagne? And, and I'm like, look, you have to know something about Pacific Crest Trail hikers, I'm telling these people. We're hungry. We're hungry all the time. And if you offer us food, we're going to say yes. Now, do you want some champagne? I'm like, okay, I warned you. So I sit there right in the dirt and they've got music and they've got lights and they give me a solo cup full of champagne, super high class. And so we're chit chatting, we're drinking this champagne. And they're like, do you want some fruit? And I'm like, look. You heard me the first time, right? And fruit is, is a rare delicacy for us. It's heavy. It's heavy and it's fresh. And, and I'm like, yes, yes, I would like some fruit. So Jimmy from the, from the wedding party walks over, gets an orange out of the cooler, hands it to me, and I eat the whole thing. And he's like, do you want another one? Yes, Jimmy. Yes, please give me another one. They're like, do you want a sandwich? Yes, and at this point, I think they're just testing me. Like, how much can you actually put in your stomach? Did I mention the two pizzas? Like, I'm gonna win this. And then they're like, do you want a beer? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes. I, I just gave up at that point. And finally they got all, um, you know, they had to go get all pretty for the wedding. And I finally found my campsite, which is actually right next door to theirs. So they go do their thing and I go down and take my shower. So they did all of this before a shower, which that's real magic. So I go down, I take a shower, I get some ice cream and, you know, because it's before dinner and you always have your ice cream before dinner, charge my phone, get some dinner, get some beer. Finally, I'm full. It takes hours, but finally I'm full. So I had had pre-dinner, dinner, pre-dinner, dinner, and then dinner. And then I come back to my tent and it's nighttime by then, it's late. And there's this note for me on my tent. And initially I thought this note was gonna be, why didn't you post your receipt? And I didn't post my receipt because the clip had been torn off the sign. But no, it's this, um, Heidi, in the brown cooler, we've, we've left some wedding food for you. And I, I go to the cooler and I'm so full, I'm about to burst. And in the cooler, there's green beans and rice and salmon. And I'm like, oh, Jimmy, that's magic. So. I set it inside my tent. I figure that the pungent aroma of salmon is not gonna draw any bear in this very developed campground, but I can't carry it with me because it's messy and salmon and bear. So that was my breakfast the next morning. I had rice and salmon and potatoes and green beans for breakfast. And that's trail magic in a big way, right? Just people, unexpected acts of generosity doing really beautiful things. So sometimes it's other hikers. Sometimes it's just random people who, for whatever reason, decide to be generous. And sometimes it's entire camps. So there's this place called Big Lake Youth Camp. It's a Seventh-day Adventist camp for youth. And they just open up their camp to all these random strangers 
random dirty strangers from all over the world. So the only thing that PCT hikers, Pacific Crest Trail hikers have in common is that we're walking on the same trail, that's it. And this youth camp has all these signs They're like, welcome, please check in. And the only thing they ask in return is that you don't smoke, you don't drink, and you don't bring a gun. Why would you bring a gun? Do you know how heavy guns are? <laughs> We're not, that, that made me laugh. My, my Swiss army knife was this, this long right? It, the, there's not a lot of weapons that we're going to be carrying, but that's all they ask in return to keep their youth safe was that we don't smoke, we don't drink, and we don't bring a gun. And in return for that, they opened up their, their entire camp for us. They had a whole shelter where we could just hang out, do laundry for free. And in fact, when I was in there kind of figuring out where the washing machine was, they apologized to me because they had run out of laundry soap and needed to go get more. I mean, the, the generosity here was just heartbreaking. Now, um, so people from all over the world, people in that photo are coming from Prague and Germany and South uh, Salt Lake City and North Carolina. So all over the world, all kinds of backgrounds. And they're just like here for free. We couldn't sleep in there because we weren't allowed to sleep on the campgrounds because of the youths, but we were allowed to hang out there during daylight hours. They also um, fed us. <laughs> and what you, um, that is the best possible kind of food there can be. It's crunchy, which is hard to get on the trail and it's fresh. So those giant plates of salad, you can kind of tell a BCT hiker because they can never get enough of the salads and they always just dump rotten dressing on it because you can also never get enough of the calories. So there, were, uh, there was a taco bar, there was a salad. And what you don't see is what happened right after that. So the guy from Prague comes up the stairs and we're surrounded by families with children, clean families with you know children. And he's got watermelon on his plate and every hiker perks up and there's like, there's watermelon. And then the thundering herd down the stairs as they all run after their fruit and all the parents just turn and laugh at us. So trail magic in a big, big way. Sometimes it's just campers. So Alali Lake, that's Mount Jefferson in the background. And I had just climbed up and over Mount Jefferson the day before. And this was a, an intense day for me because somebody asked me, they're like, are you crushing 20s yet? And I'm like, I'm going to crush 20. So this was the first day that I was trying to do more than 20 miles in one day. I got about 24-ish miles in that day. I was really proud. So I had started fairly close to uh, Mount Jefferson and I was gonna pause at Olali after about five miles and have breakfast. So I was hungry and it was crabby because I'm very crabby when I'm hungry. Um, so I, I get there and I sit down and there's a little store and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy a Pop-Tart and I'm gonna get some coffee and the coffee's gonna be hot. This is gonna be great. So I sit down, I'm getting ready to buy my stuff. And these, two, these children come running by and they're like, are you a hiker? I'm like, yes. And they're like, are you hungry? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Do you want some breakfast? Yes. And they, uh, maybe children? <laughs> and they go running off and I'm like, do you want me to follow? I, like, do I, am I following these children? Like they're, they're, and they're like, no, stay right here. And so they go leave. And then their mom comes back and she's like, are you hungry? <laughs> And she's got this cardboard thing and it has, this is my share. It has melon, it has English muffins, it has banana bread, it has bacon. And what you don't see there is the thermos full of scrambled eggs that I also had. So, so much food. So that's trail magic. It doesn't all have to be food related, but it's just people who want to give things to hikers to make this hard thing that they're doing a little bit easier. So trail magic played a big role in Cheryl Strait's wild. And it was something that, I mean, it feeds your belly for sure. And it makes you clean, which is nice. But there's something really beautiful about being treated so consistently with kindness and generosity. The world isn't always a kind and generous place. 
And it's nice when you can be reassured that humanity, hopefully at its core is, is good, right? It really restores your faith in humanity when you encounter these things over and over again. So there are also, how do I want to transition here? So, uh, oh yes. So trail magic doesn't always come in the form of food. I already mentioned that Oregon was on fire uh, and California and Washington and Canada uh, were all on fire this summer and last summer and the summer before. And there, and I already mentioned the McKinley fire, which was, um, it was, it broke out around July 29th. I was, I started my hike around the 5th of August and the McKinley fire, which was just North of South. It was around Shasta, Mount Shasta, which is just South of the Oregon border. It went on to build, uh, burn 60,000 acres, kill four people, and destroy 185 structures. So it burned across the trail. And one of the things that happened, and this is very minor in the grand scheme of things, but in terms of the hiking community, this was huge. People commandeered buses because people had to evacuate the trail. This fire burned hot and fast, and people were caught in the middle of it and had to get off the trail as soon as possible at walking pace. So people were commandeering buses to drive hikers around the closure because these closures can be quite large. This impacted me a little bit because it, I wanted to start at the California border and I couldn't. I had to start at Mount Ashland, which was about a day and a half north because everything south of there was closed because of the fire. And if something is closed because of a fire, I'm gonna respect that, right? I think that that's, that's just good manners. The one, the fire that impacted me more than the McKinley was the Wendigo fire because that one was in my path. It um, closed a section of the trail between Crater Lake and um, Shelter Cove, Willamette Pass. And that's about a 75 mile stretch of trail. So I knew, and there's three different ways to get around these closures when they happen, depending on what your goals are as a hiker. So some folks would do that flip-flopping that I was just talking about. They'll skip things and come back. Some people are really personally motivated in a continuous footpath. So they're gonna walk from California, from Mexico to Canada. They're gonna walk from Mexico to Canada. And if they have to walk or on the road around these detours, then that's what they're gonna do. Some of them will also walk through the detours at night, hoping they won't get caught by any rangers and have their permits taken away. Not really my cup of tea. Um, I kind of respect that you want to not put yourself in a dangerous situation that somebody else is gonna have to also put themselves in to rescue you, but that's one strategy. The strategy that I was going for was either to hitchhike around, which is really common, or uh, you can use social media. There are full on trail angel social media pages and you can just say, hey, here I am, I need help. And people will, help, random strangers will help you. So I'm a sure thing kind of girl. I didn't want to hitchhike. I did hitchhike once just to prove to myself I could, but it was like a two mile stretch that I was just too lazy to walk. It was one of those resorts that was two miles off the trail. And I just wanted to prove that I could. And I figured as a girl alone, I would get picked up pretty quickly. And I was kind of insulted that it took as long as it did. But I'd done that and I didn't feel the need to do it again. So I was going to get on social media. Um, I had already joined these trail angel pages because I knew that this was a thing. This closure had started before I had started. And I was going to put the word out that I needed a ride. So I got to Mazama and took a picture of myself looking very friendly and um, happy and, you know, like the kind of person that a random stranger would want to put in their car, you know, um, great company I am and not very dangerous. So I, I took that picture with that in mind and posted it to social media and um, looking for somebody who would just be willing to drive me 107 miles for no good reason other than I needed a ride. I get this message uh, from this guy here, Scott, and he's like, okay, I'll meet you in front of the store. So I buy a pizza and eat as much of it as I can and, you know, share the rest with this random person from Germany. And I'm just waiting for a I, I'm like, this is me. And so I, I, he knew what I looked like. So I'm just waiting for somebody to stop for this scruffy person sitting on a curb and be like, I'm your ride. 
and it was Scott. So he's a, Scott is a true trail angel. I've, I've learned since. So he spends a lot of his time shuttling people around these, um, these closures. So he did that for me. It was night, 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 by the time he got me to Shelter Cove. It was so dark that I ended up sleeping by the train tracks that night because I had no idea where the, where the campground was, where the spot for hikers was. And I didn't want to be that jerk blundering through in the dark being like, where, sorry, where, sorry. So I just slept by the train tracks. But the point there is, Scott was willing to drive me 170 miles deep into the night and then go back wherever he was going just because I needed a ride. And he was so worried that I was gonna miss the actual lake that we stopped and took pictures of sunset over Crater Lake just so that I would have that experience. Really shy guy. Um, accepted nothing from me other than we stopped at Subway and he let me buy him a sandwich. No gas money, no, nothing. He wouldn't take a dime from me. I learned later that Scott, or actually over the course of talking with him, that Scott's kind of famous as a trail angel. I, I knew nothing about him when he picked me up. He kind of keeps pace with where the bubble is. So the big clump of hikers. And he, he's a former through hiker. So he's done the Pacific Crest Trail. And there are long dry stretches. And these long dry stretches are awful because if you can't find it, you have to carry it and water is very heavy. So he leaves water caches that he monitors and stocks at various places where the dry stretches, you know, extend into 20, 30, 40 miles without water. So this is one of them that he stocks. And then the Wendigo one is even hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gallons of water. And then in addition to water, those um, boxes there contain chargers, feminine hygiene products products, uh, guidebooks in case you want to read something. And he just goes along and does all of this out of the goodness of his heart and then drives back to DC every year, which is where he lives. So yeah, Scott's pretty amazing. So sometimes magic is getting a ride. Sometimes it's just giving you the thing you need at the moment you need it. Lots of time is food. Sometimes it's just magic. So I got up that morning, you know, having slept not well by the train tracks because trains are on the train tracks and they're loud. And sometimes they like to stop and then go and then stop and then go and then stop and then go while you're trying to sleep. It's very rude. So I wake up that morning and there was another trail angel on the, uh, on the pages. He'd seen my post and he was like, hey, I'm here where I was sleeping, you know, like, a hundred yards away, I'm in the truck. If you need anything, just bang on the window. So, you know, hey, random stranger, if you need anything in the middle of the night, knock on my truck. So he comes out the next morning, we're at a different resort because I hit every resort. And he's like, and, and he had filled the hiker boxes, which is something the trail angels tend to do. So there was a whole box full of uh, handleless toothbrushes and another box full of fruit that he had done. And I'm sitting there eating and eating and eating because that's a theme, obviously. And he walks up to me and he's like, do you want to go paddleboarding? And I'm like, yes, actually, yes. I've never been paddleboarding before. Are you at? Yes. Like, why would I say no to that? And he goes to his truck, drags out a couple of paddleboards and a couple of other hikers. And I take it out. He's like, I'll take some pictures and text them to you. And we just paddleboarded around the lake and then came back, gave him his paddleboards back. He loaded them in his truck and took a hyper hiker the other way around the closure. These people are just doing things out of the kindness of their heart. It's, I know that trail magic is called magic and it's kind of disingenuous to say magical, but it's just magical. So most trail angels are uh, one of two categories of people. Either they tend to be folks who are retired and who are um, campground hosts. So they'll often give you peaches or water or sodas. They really like the company or they're former through hikers who just can't get enough of the trail and want to come back. So this is an example of a hiker vortex and some pretty intense trail magic. So a hiker vortex is just when you get tempted to stay and then you stay and then you stay more. And then sometimes you spend the night, even though you showed up at noon and you had really intended on doing another 10, 15, 20 miles that day. So 
this was Sky, and she was another trail angel, a former uh, through hiker. And she had, she's a river guide, a river rafting guide in Tennessee, and she had broken a bunch of ribs, got bored, decided to pack up her van, drive to the Pacific Crest Trail, set up camp, and give things to hikers. So there's shade. There are chairs. It is nice to sit in a chair. There are two coolers, one's full of beer, one's full of soda. There's a table full of food there. There's crunchy food, there's fresh food. There was cheesecake, there were Cheetos. These are all my favorite things. There was music and inside the van, there was a place where you could charge your electronics, which is really important because these are our navigational tools. So, and then there was a flat spot across the road for anybody who decided that, you know, five miles was really enough to do in one day. And I think every one of these hikers ended up spending the night. It was, it was a really magical vortex. <laughs> so sometimes trail angels are, usually they're former through hikers, sometimes they're former, um, uh, or sometimes they're campground hosts, sometimes they're neither. And so this one, this, uh, and oftentimes this is how you know there's magic. There's just some sort of random handwritten sign that's scrawled and left on a table, nailed to a tree. And then you just like, okay, I'll go this way. Let's see what happens if that happens. So this was um, a, an instance where there was a, a sign, it was on a table. So I wander, there's a van and he's like, do you want some ice cream? And it's like 9 a.m. I'm like, yes, I do want ice cream for breakfast. That sounds lovely. Ice cream is another thing that you can't pack. So we're chit-chatting and you know, isolation, right? It had been a while since I had seen anybody. And, and he's like, do you wanna sit down? And I'm like, yes, so he pulls out a chair. Now I have ice cream for breakfast and a chair to sit in. Life is really good. Um, it was actually a short day. I had time to hang out. This was just after I had crushed those 20s and I, this was gonna be a 10 mile day. So it was gonna be a short day. So I could linger, I could take my time. It was gonna be really nice. So he was like, this is great. Later on, I'll grill up some vegetables, which we, oh, we miss vegetables and meat. We also miss meat. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of beans and rice in our life. Um, what, what, <laughs> there's a lot of beans, a lot of mashed potatoes, so many, a lot of oatmeal. Vegetables and meat is a really lovely thing. So and he's like, do you want to charge your phone? And I'm like, yes. So he opens up the side of the van. I'm charging my phone. This is great. And then we get to joking and I'm like, you know, the only thing better than ice cream for breakfast is beer because the guy who loaned me his paddleboard as he was leaving was like, we left a beer in the hiker box for you. And I was like, yay. And I opened it up and started drinking it. And then I realized it was 10 a.m. And I'm like, well, it's 10 a.m. and I'm drinking a breakfast beer. So we were joking about that. And he's like, well, let's, let's take care of this for you. Let's get some breakfast beer. He's like, let's go ahead and go into town, right? Get all the supplies. And that way I can have a beer too. And I don't have to worry about driving. So I hop in the van, we go to government camp, which I've learned the cool kids called Gubby. And we get some beer. Uh, he gets me some jalapeno poppers. He's joking about whiskey, but Really, if you're gonna hike, and I really did want to finish my miles that day, like alcohol on any kind of stomach, it just doesn't work for hiking. So whiskey's a little too high proof for my taste. So we get back, um, we're sitting in the van. And one of the things I'd been craving because I can only use my phone for navigation. And I, the, the world of electronics had faded from my life and I had desperately wanted to watch a movie for quite some time. And I mentioned that to him and he's like, I've got a TV in the van. We can watch a movie. And I'm like, no way. The, the, the seats in the front spin around. So you've got your cinema seating. This is gonna be great. So we come back to the original spot, um, swivel the seats around and he starts setting up a movie, hands me one of the beers from uh, Govey. We're, we're set, we're gonna watch this movie. But this one, this situation was different than the other situations. And there were just these off notes in this particular situation that were starting to throw me. 
Uh, one of the first ones was when we had driven into town, you know, we'd obviously pulled the sign that said trail magic because you don't want to leave that sign if you're not going to be there. That's just mean. But when we came back, I'm like, well, let me go put the sign back. And he's like, no, no, no. The, I might not have enough supplies for everybody. And I'm like, that's, that's odd. It just didn't every other trail angel that I've experienced is welcoming to as many hikers as possible. You just saw the vortex. So there's something off there. And it wasn't just that. There were a couple of other things that were just off, but they were small. Like he had dirty feet, which seems like a small thing, but no matter where you are, if you're a hiker, you clean your feet because if you don't, you get blisters, the grit rubs. So you can be really nasty from the ankles up, you always clean your feet at night. And then some of our talks weren't the same as what I'd been experiencing on the trail. So he had been talking about guns and gun control and his guns. And hikers tend to avoid political discussions. We just don't get into these debates. So my stock response when people talk about guns, and I don't want to get into political debates because I don't, is I mentioned that I grew up in Toodle, which most people don't know, but I'm assuming most of you do know. And I remember when I was little going to high school, I guess not little, when I was high school age going to high school, you know, the boys would throw the guns on the back of their pickup trucks, pull into school, do the school thing, and then go hunting after school. It was like not a big deal. I grew up around guns. And so that's the story I always share to make myself non-threatening to people who might see me as um, a little bit more of a hippie liberal. <sighs> but these are not the kinds of things that hikers talk about. And they had just like, pinged my little antenna a little bit. But then he also started trying to guide that conversation verbally in a way that really just wasn't sitting right. So I just told you about the, the guns and the pickup trucks and the boys. And he said, based on what you said, I bet you really liked the boys. And I'm like, based on what I, I didn't, it was odd. And then he said, you seem like the kind of girl who's done acid. And I'm like, <laughs> based on, thank you, based on what? And these things were making me really nervous. As I was thinking about this, I realized that the, the beer he had bought in government camp was the highest possible proof beer you could buy. And those were the ones he was handing me while he himself was drinking the lower proof beer. And he kept talking about going back and getting whiskey and not really listening to my complete lack of interest there. And then there were just physical off notes. Like you can have a conversation and somebody can, you know, hit your knee with the side of their hand, but when they do it over and over again and touch is not being reciprocated, that's, that says something. And the, this is the one that I was always nervous sharing, but at full disclosure, the, you know, it's a van that's been converted. There's a bed in there. And he kept saying, are you sure you don't want to lay on the bed to watch the movie? And then as the, thank you, yes, this is very creepy. And then he keeps fussing with the film, like getting up and fixing the sound. Oh, there's a glare, let me shut these curtains. And all of these things was, were just making me feel very, very uncomfortable. And finally, I'm like, I don't need a reason or a time to leave. It's now is the time. Like my antenna have pinged, now is the time for me to go. So I, um, just uh, didn't wait for an opportunity. I didn't wait for a polite break in the conversation. I didn't wait for a convenient excuse. I stood up, it was mid scene, it was mid beer, it was mid conversation and I left. And he was like, did I say something wrong? And I'm like, not gonna, I'm not gonna engage with that. And he's like, but I could grill up some vegetables in meat. And I just left. Cheryl Strait has had these experiences. Um, and she talks about, I didn't walk, I ran. Oops. <laughs> And Cheryl Strayed isn't the only PCT, female PCT hiker walking alone who's experienced these things. It's pretty common for women alone. Heather Anish, who is the FKT holder, fastest known time holder, she did all 2,650 miles in 60 days. She was averaging 40 miles a day. And she kept telling herself, don't look like prey, don't look like prey, don't look like prey. Uh, when she encountered these kinds of things. So I didn't run. I did uh, walk in a way that didn't look like prey. 
I climbed up that mountain, I reflected and I Googled signs of abuse and coercion. And these things came up that people who are abusive and who are coercing you, they ignore boundaries and invade your privacy. They dismiss you and your feelings and they use guilt. And I thought that the definition of coercion as relentless pestering was particularly useful, especially when I started framing my experiences within that, those definitions. So pulling the trail sign, he was isolating me, telling me that I was the kind of girl who liked acid, who must have loved the boys. That's gaslighting. He was rewriting the past. I never said anything that made him, that would have prompted those kinds of um, topics. His trail magic was actually setting up a transactional relationship. I will give you this, and then you will give me. Uh, buying and pushing those higher proof beers is impairing. The fussing over the, the sun coming through the door and starting to close the curtains, he was enclosing me. And that not wanting me to leave, are you sure I could? Are you sure I could? It's relentless pestering. So if I was thinking about all of this and I was thinking about the moral of the story, I mean, is the moral of the story really not to take rides from strangers? Or is it don't take candy from strangers? It's not really that one either. Is it don't talk to strangers? I, I was thinking about this a lot, and I think the moral of the story really is that those morals do harm, because th that was the first reaction I got the first time I told my story. You didn't get in the van, did you? And I lied. Said, nope, not me. Didn't get in the van. When those are the only morals of the story, they silence the person who's more, whose story is more complex than that single story of how to be in the world. And that's the magic of wild. It's a different kind of map. You see your story in that story and you see a navigation for how to recognize and get out of these kinds of situations. So without these stories, how are we gonna go about identifying, recognizing and acting on models for how to effectively recognize and address these situations when we encounter, uh, when we encounter them? So this is the moral of the story that we have to structure our listening so that we're creating space where people can feel safe to tell these kinds of stories and to tell all of their story, the light magic and the dark. Thank you. We have a couple minutes if we have any questions. Yes. I was wondering how you feel about some of Cheryl Strayed's stories that seem so impossible. Well, like she would have died many times over during her novel, not her novel, but her story of walking the trail. Do you think that there was any uh, exaggeration there? Um, I've got a couple of the stories like that myself. So, I've lived enough of those experiences that I kind of trust those stories. Terrified of snow, her ice axe stories, her stories of walking across passes. There's a reason that I hike in August. Snow is not my friend. Um, I tend to think that those stories are true. Uh, and maybe the other reason that I tend to think those stories are true is just because of the raw emotional vulnerability that she shares with stories that like this one was hard for me to tell. Um, I hope they're true because I admire the courageousness she has in telling them. Oh, I'm coming around. What did you say your trail name was? I forget. Double Dare. Double Dare? Okay, Double Dare. thanks. Yeah. Is that based on the old Nickelodeon game show? 
No, it's because uh, there's a boy and a girl and they wanted to pitch a tent together on the dock. And I said, double dare you to do it. And I was so hungry for a trail name. And he's like, that should be your trail name. And you're not allowed to give yourself a trail name. So I'm like, yes, take it. So what is your greatest takeaway from your trail experience? There's a line from Thoreau that resonates in my head a lot. And it's, I think we can safely trust more than we do. And whether it was humans or water or trail conditions, I just kept telling myself that over, that in the Bob Marley, every little thing's gonna be all right. And it was, right, I'm here and I'm happy. That's a beautiful place to, uh, to leave it then. Um, I do have a couple of announcements. So please join us again uh, next Thursday for Chris Tower. I like to read banned books. Um, we have Lindsay from the library back there. She's got a cart with her again. And I forgot to mention earlier, this series is brought to us by Humanities Washington and a generous grant. So please thank you to the Humanities Washington Project for allowing us to bring in all these speakers. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Heidi. And uh, have a great day.